Police have identified four victims and plan on more than just the four murder charges filed today. Okay, guys, it's good to be back again <clears throat> on this episode and in this series. We have discussed the Rancho Cardova cat burglar, which he started a couple of years prior, and he was also the Visalia ransacker, where the Golden State Killer earned his first two nicknames, and had committed at this point 180 break-ins and ransackings of homes, and a tip and a, a few attempted kidnappings, one murder and one murder or attempted murder of a police officer. Plus several indecent, indecent exposures and killings of dogs. So, Dang. <clears throat> yeah, he wasn't exactly a uh, Mr. Upstanding Citizen at this point. At all. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it seems like a deep resume already. Um, and um, at this point, it's been a little, it hasn't been child's play because we described a lot of things that he's done. But in this series, he's definitely just turn the notch up again. Um, now the heat was on after the murder and attempted murder in Visalia. So the golden state killer at this time took some time off completely. And this is a part where he morphed into the East area rapist. But before the media and the police would give him that nickname, um, the time period was now 1976 May of that year. So, okay. Here's the thing. How do you th do you do you think he changed his appearance at all? I'm going to say he did. He may have grown grown a beard or something or let his hair grow out or you know, maybe lost some weight or gained some weight. So I'm going to say yeah, he did change his appearance. You Gabby? I'm going to say no because he doesn't care and he is a very cocky person and the fact that People are not catching on that he's from two different areas already. He feels he cannot be identified somewhere else. You're right about the cockiness, but he actually went with what Matt did, and he actually dropped forty. What? He dropped forty pounds, and wow, and, yeah, and grew wow. up. Because remember, we were describing him as being pudgy. Um, yeah, he was a little pudgy. Yeah, he was pudgy, and but still athletic. But now he's dropped the forty pounds completely and grew out a mustache. Dang. So Dang. there's Dang. Even faster, huh? Yeah, he's even faster, more agile. Um Dang. So in 1976, this is May, the last offenses took place in October of the previous year in 75. <clears throat> so in 1976 in May, he's photographed with some kids at a park taking time on a lunch break with another fellow officer playing baseball with him. And he's a slim guy, mustache looks like in complete shape you know i mean looks better than the other officer okay. um his fellow officers say though at this time he's a little to himself has a bit of a temperament but for the most part is a nice guy um it's just a month later though in june where his where he would actually get back into the swing of things um Dang. Yeah. A 23-year-old woman in Rancho Cardova begins to see a car in her neighborhood parked across the street. She peers out the window <clears throat> or even to retrieve the newspaper and looks at the car to recognize the man. But in every instance, he looks away when she tries to make eye contact. So then just two nights before the first attack, she begins to get phone calls and she and she answers and she just hears heavy breathing like on our intros. And she doesn't re she doesn't report these. So on the night of June 18th, 1976, at 4 a.m., she awakens to a man lying on top of her with a knife to her forehead. Through 
Yeah. So through clenched teeth, he's like, you know, like grinding out his his words, wearing a brown ski mask, a brown T-shirt and naked from the waist down. He takes off, um, takes off her clothes and and um, he sticks her with a knife in her in her side. And and she he tells her, get completely naked. She complies, but she's going slow. So through his clenched teeth, he's yelling again, like, girl, hurry, you know, like that. As she does, as she does, he notices, and this is where that stuff's going to start to come in, a maxi pack on her, uh, you know, on her uh, area, and she's on her period. He he rolls her over on her stomach, ties her up with diamond-shaped knots around her wrists and ankles, then gags her uh, with some torn cloths from the sheet of her bed. And he begins to rummage through the house, breaking things, removing things, going through cabinets, um, all the stuff that he would do in those ransackings he's doing here. He's talking to himself. Uh-huh. Uh, he's pretending that someone is with him. Uh, he starts to eat. Whoa, whoa. Yeah, he starts to eat like whatever she's got in the refrigerator. Um, then he returns. Nuts. Yeah, he is nuts. Then he returns to her and says she's beautiful, then rapes her. Then... Why don't you go period? Yes, yes. Ugh. Yeah, so then so then after that, um what do you think he does? I'ma say he kills her because he was on her period and he got blood all over. So he's gonna add more blood to the scene. <laughs> he took a shower. <laughs> no, both of those would kind of like make sense, but and especially the shower, but he leaves and just casually gets on to, you know, he ties her back up, goes into the kitchen, drinks a beer, eats some potato chips, and then, uh, you know, rummages through the house. Then he returns to, and rapes her again. Um, what the? Yeah. Then he, he cleans up with her sheets and, you know, wipes himself off or whatever. And um, he just, he's like, all right. And he leaves. Um, but But not before rummaging through the house, taking more time. And then it's not till she believes like 15 minutes of silence that he's gone, that she unlooses the the diamond uh, knot in her wrist and her ankles, and she phones police. Um, <clears throat> the investigators would see that the man had pre-tied ropes outside and the back sliding glass door, and they saw that nothing was stolen, but her living space and her home along with her body were controlled and abused by the monster. He was in her house for an hour and a half. Damn, man. Yeah, an hour and a half. Yo, that's torture. That is torture, right? Every every minute counts, but an hour and a half, that feels like a whole day, bro. I, I bet, right? I mean, that's he's playing mind games. So as you'll see as we go along, you know, where you think it's about the sex, it's not really about the sex. It's about the control. Bingo. Bingo. <clears throat> so um, police were baffled and thought it was someone she knew because the person had scoped her out for a while. He had left a bottle of baby oil in the bathroom, which he used to lube himself up. So with all that, <clears throat> almost a month to the day later, Saturday, July 17th, 1976. Now in the city of Carmichael, which is right next to Rancho Cordova. Um, it's a spitting okay. image of the city. Same kind of tract houses, same kind of everything, right? Um, now, this is the part where it's going to piss you guys off. And it pissed me off, and it still does, even though I know the outcome and everything to this. It's just a, a gruesome... So, prepare yourselves. <clears throat> um, okay, here we go. Yeah, so for some reason, a family of four wasn't a family of four this particular night because the parents of a 15-year-old... And a 13-year-old were out of town. The two sisters were left as the parents went on a business trip, which was just, I guess, in, somewhere in Sacramento or San Francisco. So it wasn't too far, but you're talking 150 miles away from your two teenage daughters. Left alone. Okay. The two sisters were watching movies, eating popcorn before they decided to go to bed around 12 a.m. Just okay. two hours later, the 15-year-old awoke to a man half-naked on top of her with a knife and through clenched teeth again saying, 
Do whatever I say, and I won't kill you. She, wow. Fifteen. Fifteen. He's disgusting. Exactly. But she's not by herself, though, at the time, right? She's with her 13-year-old sister. But, now, here's the, here's the problem. Her 13-year-old sister, they have separate rooms. She has no idea what's going on with her 13-year-old sister at all. She asks him. She begs. He won't tell her anything. She wants to scream, but she can't because she's so frightened. He slapped her and told her to shut up when she kept asking about where her sister was and if she was okay. She began to cry, and he slapped her again. The girl settled down at some point and started to do what she what he wanted to do because she didn't want her sister to be hurt. So he laid her on her stomach. He tied her up again with those diamond shaped, um, uh, was it knots on her hands? And she was hogtied basically like a, like a calf, you know what I mean? With her legs up, hands behind her back. Um, then through the house, he did the ransacking stuff again, breaking stuff, talking to himself. He would return to ask her where the money was. She said she didn't know where it was. He slapped her. Um, he looked around some more. He was asking where did the doctor's um, pills, where were they at? And she's like, doctors? And then she's like, how do you know my dad's a doctor? And he's like, shut up. Just tell me where the pills are. And she's like, I don't know. I don't know. So he kept just coming in and asking her stuff. Then he returned to nibble on her ear and then, he, yeah, to nibble on her ear, went back and rummaged some more. And then, this is where it gets graphic again, he laid behind her, and with her hands tied behind her back, he put his penis in her hands and said, play with it. Where, at, Yeah, and so, as she tried to, she couldn't really move her hands, he slapped her, and then he said, have you ever done this before? And then she said, no. And then it got quiet. He got up and left. Then he came He came back to untie her ankles, and he raped her. What? Yes. Um, yes, and he said that, I've seen you at the junior prom, and I've wanted you since then. Wow. So he's been stalking her for a minute. Looks like it. Now... He said, I knew I had to have you. He grinned, and then he left. She waited another 20 minutes before she freed herself to where she could hobble into her sister's room. And when she hobbled into her sister's room, um, she removed her sister's gag. And thankfully, her sister was not assaulted at all. She was tied up, though, and gagged at the same time. So wow. she didn't experience any of the stuff that her sister did, but unfortunately, her sister did. So how long how long do you think he was in the house this particular time? I'm gonna say he was in there for about an hour, hour and a half as well. What do you think? I'm gonna give it two two to three hours. Bingo, Gabby got it. Two and a half, almost three hours. What? So double the time torturing these two kids. I mean, what do you think about this guy so far? So far, he's a scumbag. I, I'm gonna just say that he's a pedophile, mm -hmm. and he's he's something's wrong with him. He's twisted, like he something's wrong in his brain. Yeah, I just don't understand how grown people get off of messing with kids because even at 15, you're not a full grown teenager. Even like. I would put that till 17, about to be 18, where yeah. you could say you look more like a woman, but it's like, what the hell is wrong with people? Yeah. She's still a child. How does that turn you on? And I think it's just because he's this crappy, incapable, small wiener bastard, <laughs> and so therefore he needs young why, girls why to talk to, feel why you accomplished. Talk about, why are you not talking about his manhood? <laughs> because hey, she, he has an issue because... <laughs> yeah you know what you're absolutely right i mean that's he's overcompensating and he's taking it out on these women i mean yeah i couldn't have said it any better um so when the <clears throat> when the police arrived they saw the pre-cut rope again and the mess that he had left throughout the house no shoe prints though this time were found at the scene 
but the entryway again was through the sliding glass back door. The assailant had scoped out the house and knew the ins and outs. And again, these homes, for the most part, were built the same. Now, Carmichael and Rancho Cardova are right next to each other, like literally right next to each other, two small towns. And this is the second case. Now, Rancho Cardova had to deal with the cat burglar stuff a couple years before, but this is a whole new thing with a rape. So they weren't linking those, and they weren't linking these two, even though Carmichael's right next to each other. You'll see what happens as we move along here. But um, So attack number three was the early morning of August 26th, 1976, again nearly a month later. A 12-year-old thought she heard wind chimes, but when she looked out her window, it was a man hanging upside down from the roof staring at her with a ski mask and a brown shirt on. She ran out of her, out of her mother's room. He was trying to release um, her screen door to come in, or a screen on the window. The father worked nights, so he wasn't home. The mother took a flashlight and grabbed her 12-year-old and a 15-year-old, and they made their way to the sliding glass door. They did not see anything, su- uh, um, see anything at the time, but then suddenly crashing through the window, the rapist appeared naked from the waist down and a ski mask with only holes in the eyes and a brown shirt holding a knife in one hand and a club in the other with gloves and boots and a slim build he looked at the mother who had picked up the phone to di- to dial the operator he said put the put the phone down or i will kill all of you i will gut every last one of you i know who's here and who's not she hung up the phone but when the rapist went for the 12 year old the mom grabbed the gun as she did the rapist beat her over the head and gained control of of the weapon and her he then hit her with the gun and the the billy club at the same time so now screaming and bleeding the two kids made it into their room locked the door and began to to open their window and take their screen off to get out of the house as they were doing that um the east area rapist grabbed the the mom and was trying to tie her up but he heard noises in the in the room and screaming from the girls so at the same time as he's trying to wrap her up, he's looking outside towards the, the walkway or the, the hallway, and he's confused. Mm-hmm. The mom breaks free, and as she breaks free and gets to the front door and opens it, he hits her over the head two more times. But she kicks, she kicks the rapist, and he kind of trips. So she makes it outside screaming and bloody, and her kids are screaming, and here come all the neighbors out of the homes next door. And as they do, they see a man running as fast as he can, butt naked from the waist down, out of her front yard. And then they, <laughs> yeah. So they make it to the, the people, to the neighbors. And two minutes later, the police are there already. Um, when they get there, they find three wow. three sets of, um, of uh, ties. So he meant to, to tie up the kids. And they didn't find his pants. Um the police tried to ser- uh, search the adjacent area and everything. They couldn't find anything. They thought maybe he had a car with his pants in it or whatever. Um, they tried to look for everything and anything kind of evidence, but besides the ropes left at the scene, nothing else. And this attack was on Paseo Drive or Paseo Avenue, just literally a block over from attack number one in Rancho Cardova. Dang. How does he get it? Oh, clean. So he he's prepared, so he stops all these things because he has the right amount of rope and everything he needs for the amount of people that are there. Mm-hmm. He's he's doing he's he's doing hang up phone calls. He's he's doing his homework. Like like watch, check this part out real quick. He says, um, whereas the police investigated, the, the the media was not notified of the recent attacks in Rancho Cardova, which was the second one. And the one in Carmichael was not uh, linked at this point either, but they were spot on. With this attempted rape um, and more foiled, however, uh, or or this attempted rape, the police knew that they had a serial predator uh, possibly in the area and failed to notify the community at this this time. The mother would recover but would uh, require several stitches and bruises. This, unfortunately, would be uh, the rare time 
that he did not get what he wanted. The father came home and was was so upset and obviously felt um, bad about the situation, but he also felt a premonition that the attacker was in the house prior to um, prior to the attack because his new shift hours were left on the um, refrigerator door and it showed that he switched from day shift to night shift. So he came at night shift knowing that the father wasn't there. Mm. <laughs> so maybe he was in the home all day like when nobody was there. Yeah, and he he found out that the husband wouldn't be there cuz at this at these times with the exception of the time that he murdered Claude Snelling, he he really didn't mess with people that had their the husbands or the fathers home. He would always go after single families or things like that when he knew the husband was gone. Here's my question. Mm-hmm. I know he's I know he's a police officer and he's doing his homework very well. Do you think he on his job patrolled the area and maybe stopped at the house and did like some little questioning, like, "Hey, good morning. This is I'm Officer Whoever." I'm just checking the area to see if everything's okay. You know what I'm saying? Something like that. Do you think he scoped it out like that? I don't think he went to the doors because that would, like, then someone would say, well, there was an officer over here. I think what he might have did is <clears throat> some, something similar to what you're talking about, like maybe go into, like, because um, I know at that time still uh, everything was primitive, but you could probably look up people in the neighborhood at certain addresses. So maybe he saw a house or, or a person that he – you know, patrolling the area, driving by, saw a cute girl, and then went back to the station, pulled up the information, see who was living there, and maybe that's how he began to stalk them. Because how else would he get the that's phone possible. numbers, right? Yeah, that's possible. But um, well, back in the days, everybody was registered, so you can easily get people's phone numbers. You know, I didn't even think of that. That's true. Yeah, he probably just was really good at the Yellow Book or Yellow Pages. Yeah, Yellow Pages. <laughs> So, um, so anyway, uh, the police think he had a car close by, but they never found the car, but there was washway. So there was a, a, a area where he could get away on a bike or something like that. Um, so now we're up to attack number four, which would be in Carmichael on September 4th, 1976, a 27 year old woman would be coming home to her parents' house to do laundry because her laundry machine wasn't working at her apartment. So as she came to hers uh, at the laundry <clears throat> room where her parents lived, it was in the garage. So she was finishing up her laundry. She locked the front door in the house, and she was just about ready to close the garage door. When someone rested their arm on her shoulder, she turned around and took a club right to the face, breaking her nose and knocking her out. Dang. Yeah. He then dragged her into the house and tied her up. He cut her clothes with a knife. When she woke, he asked if anyone was expected to be home. Then he said he was in the army and he needed a car and he slept with a lot of women and they loved it. Then he raped and sodomized her. He forced her to swallow stuff twice before dragging her outside and tying her up and gagging her. And raping her in the little patio area outside the back back door. Um, Whoa. Yeah. It wasn't till about an hour to an hour and a half later that someone that was jogging in the back canal area, they have a little walkway or a little, you know, hiking trail or whatever by the canal, looked in the backyard and saw her tied up naked to the post and called police. Um. So the description was the same as the four prior attacks, but nothing to identify anyone. Plus, the police had figured due to the fell attack, he got pissed and saw an opportunity and took it out on this poor woman. So by not getting what he got or what it, what he wanted at that previous attack, this poor woman was wrong place, wrong time. He saw her alone and just took it out on her. Um okay. Yeah, so <clears throat> on this one again, diamond knots were found. And um, remember Richard Shelby from the first episode that was, you know, the detective that was doing the cat burglar yeah. stuff? 
Well, he got yeah. a, he got assigned these cases, the three cases. And um, he realized they were all the same person because of the knots and the different things and the, the ways they broke in and the, the stuff that was being stolen. Because in the, in the same areas where these rapes were being occurred, their neighbors were having stuff stolen, like little things like garden gnomes, bicycles, um, stuff off their porches, whatever. And they, they chalked it up to kids messing around. They, and then the neighbors would get prank calls. But it wasn't focused in on the on that certain person. So Shelby had this. He was like, you know what? This is all linked. And then he made a smart phone call, calling the or uh, surrounding districts. And he heard about the Carmichael one. And he's like, dude, that's just like the ones we have here. So he linked the four cases together right away. Um. Wow. Yeah. So um, Shelby also uh, what is it? Uh, Traced the diamond knots back to Navy nautical knots, and he believed that the the attacker was former Naval Academy person, which we all know Joseph was in the Navy. Mm-hmm. But but that's all they all had. His war stories. Exactly, all his war stories. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but that's all they had at this point. So I mean, as a police officer and a detective, like, what do you do? You know, like like it's not big enough to make a task force yet but it's scary and at this point after four attacks and you know it's four attacks the same dude no media was notified and the community wasn't warned dang yeah so nobody nobody knew there was a serial rapist out there outside of the police outside of the police nope that is so responsible that's irresponsible for them i agree I mean, yeah. I mean, you got to keep the public informed. Think, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. No. At, at this point, you would think they would have announced it, so everybody is like, like, on watch, and also have like undercover cops scoping the streets. Yeah, and see, and that's the thing. If they had something like that, which they did in Visalia, maybe they would have caught him. Who knows? But they never took that approach until it was way too late. As we'll move on. But as we move on to attack number five, this one is probably the f- the most famous out of the early attacks because of who the woman became after uh, her her whole whole ordeal. This basically changed this woman's life for the good. Um, she was the woman that was assaulted went uh, just faced a lot of trauma and p. PTSD, but she turned it into a positive thing. Um, from the years after her being victimized, as we'll describe, uh, she became a counselor for victims advocate um, programs and for raped and battered women. And she opened the doors to because there wasn't any kind of crisis centers at this particular time for um, women that were raped. And she was one of the people in Northern California who would be making a huge difference in different communities by um, giving that voice to the people that were raped and giving that outlet or the counseling, the free counseling that these women needed, you know? So she turned a negative into a super positive. Um, And you can look her up. Her name is Jane Carson Smith. Um, So at the time of the attack, she was living in a city called Citrus Heights. And this will be another one that will pop up. Um, Citrus Heights from time to time in this series because he bounces f- from city to city in the same kind of area. So um, this one again is just north of Rancho Cordova, and along with it with her husband, uh, she was uh, stationed at a local naval base. They had they had a f- um, five year old son at the time. Oh, I'm sorry, three year old son at the time. On okay. sept- on September 29th. They saw someone snooping around their house and their son's room had been broken into and some of the, her jewelry was missing. It was reported to the police. Oh. Yeah, it was reported to the police and not linked to any of the incidents before. But three days of, of uh, hang up calls and heavy breathing to her house was getting really annoying. So on September 3rd, 1976, she yelled back at the caller, cussing him out. He laughed and hung up and called her up. Well, before he did, called her a B. And then um, 
September 4th was different from the other attacks. This one started once her husband literally left the driveway at 6.40 a.m. to work. She had to get up to at 8 a.m. to take her three-year-old son to daycare, then go off to work herself. So she was still in bed with her son. He barely left the room. However, she wouldn't get it. Uh, she wouldn't get that chance to go to work that day because she heard a door open. Now she thought it was the front door, but five minutes later, she gets up. Um, she or she thought that her husband had forgotten something, you know. So she gets up out of the bed, and as she opens the door to the the bedroom leading to the hallway, she looks right at down the hallway and running at her. Picture this. You're not even awake yet. You got eye crust in your eyes. You're, you know, you're just like waking up because you hear a noise and you open your, your bedroom door, look down a hallway, and there's a guy with a knife and rope running right at you. Dang. Yeah. So. What do you do? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, she stood there frozen. Oh, go ahead, Gabby. That's not what you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What'd you say, Gabby? No, I'm saying run back. <laughs> yeah, right? Do something, right? Um, Do something. Don't freeze. Yeah, so she froze, dude. She froze. Um, he grabbed her and put the knife to her throat and then spun her around, and she was still frozen. He had a huge mask he had, uh, on, her, on his face with just the eyes cut out, and he was dressed almost the same as the others. And he said that all he wanted was her money. And that if she didn't comply, he'd kill her and her son. So terrified, she let him tie her up. Now she's tied up on the bed. He had the pre-cut uh, knots, the pre-cut uh, shoelaces, everything, right? So he hogtied her. Dang. So then um, he gagged her, blindfolded her, everything. And then she's trying to squirm for her son. And her son was taken away. She doesn't know where her son's at. The the rapist then, uh, what is it, uh, took a chair and propped it against the front door. And he locked any other doors around and put plates in front of certain things so that if someone were to come back, they would knock, knock over stuff, make noise, and he could make a getaway. Um, the rapist then came back to Jane and told her uh, he, that he's going to put his penis in her hands and to play with it. And again... You know, she he couldn't get much arousal out of it because her hands are tied. And she didn't have much movement. So she complained that her hands were tied up and that she couldn't, you know, help him at all. And through clenched teeth, he yelled at her and said, shut up. And then grabbed her head and pushed it into the, into the pillow. Then, he, then uh, he untied her ankles and he raped her. And then... Wow. Yeah, then he said that after seeing her at the Naval Academy ball... He had to have her. And then, what the heck? yeah, then he said, is my penis as good as the captain's, meaning her husband? He got up, rummaged wow. through the house, and then came back and raped her again. And then she was besides herself at this point with grief and terror because, again, where's her son? She doesn't care about herself. She's freaked out about her son. So finally, as he's going to make his exit and she's crying, he lifts up her blindfold, brings her son into the room who was tied up at this point and laid him next to her and he left. The rapist had told the boy prior to the attack when he was tying him up that we're playing cops and robbers. Oh, wow. Freaking wow. Yes. Come on, man. Uh, yeah, something's really the wrong with fine? The boy was fine. He was not hurt. He had just been tied up. So, um... Okay, wait a minute. This guy keeps talking about proms and balls and stuff. Like, is this some kind of... He feels rejected by these girls or, like, they're too good for him that he feels he's going to get vengeance this way and, like, have them his way? You know, these are questions I wish we can answer, and I don't have the answers for them. The only thing I do know is that he would, when he would rummage through the houses, that's what I forgot to mention in the last attack with a 15-year-old and the 13-year-old. He saw a picture of the girl, the 15-year-old, with her boyfriend at 
the um, what is it called the dance, and then that's how he knew to say that he wanted her since the dance. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. so he didn't actually see her at no prom or anything. No, he just knew he saw something. So yeah, he's using like um, actual information, facts about their lives, to freak them out even more because that's what turns them on. Yes, exactly. Because I think that's part of the rummaging part through the house is he wants. Because remember how he knew about the doctor's pills. Stuff like that. He he wants to use his stuff against them because the more he knows, like you said, the more it's going to freak them out. See, see, I was giving him too much credit. I thought he was really doing his homework <laughs> and and stalking these people. Like, yo, how did he know she was in fifth? You know, fifteen. You know what I'm saying? So, okay, makes sense now. Yeah, Got yeah. It. So, and yeah, I think he's looking for best ways to make them fearful. Fear yes, them more because that makes them feel more powerful. Oh, yes. Wow. Yes. So there's, there is a, a really big psychological game to his game, and he's, he's going to use it. So, um, so what happens is she, she grabs her son. She's able to wiggle out of stuff. It takes her a while, but she does. Now, she grabs a kid, and then she goes to call police, and the phone lines have been cut. He cut all the phone lines. Wow. Dang. So she had a to put some clothes on or a robe and go next door. And one of the next door neighbor's kids was leaving. He was the last one to leave the house to school. He, she caught her, caught the kid before the kid left and they were able to use his phone and call the police. Um, when the police arrived, they found, uh, the, the same knots. Uh, they got the same description. Uh, they actually brought in Shelby brought in a bloodhound and, um, that traced the scent to a parking lot three blocks away when it was lost. So meaning the guy ran three blocks, got to his car, took off. But however, here's something to remember for later on. Right before the bloodhound lost the scent, the dog began to shake his head and act really erratic and in a re real weird way, indicating to the police um, that the dog and uh, that the, Indicating to the police handler of the dog that the rapist maybe had an illness such as cancer or he was a heavy drug user. Dogs Whoa. yeah, wow. dogs can kind of just pick that stuff up, I guess. That's crazy. Yeah. I know. I have seen something about that. They were using dogs to test people to know if they have cancer. The dog could tell. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, that's a strong nose. <laughs> I'm going to guess he was using drugs because he yeah. did ask the girl where all the pills were. I'm going I'm to say the same thing. Probably drugs. Okay, because that's going to come into play. I'm not going to reveal that one, but you'll see what happens, and then we'll see who's right and wrong. Okay. But um, on this one, several... Can we do, like, one giant 10-hour episode? <laughs> <laughs> <I know. laughs> Why do you do that, Todd? I'm Maybe sorry. I don't like you now, man. <laughs> <laughs> we might have to do a marathon on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Yeah, so um, several people had seen a Chevy Vega in the, in the neighborhood prior. Um, and keep in mind that Chevy Vega, too, because it will play a part as, okay. we, as we move along here, too. So and you got, like, several things you got to keep in mind, Doc. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Put a pin in it, man. <laughs> Put a pin. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so um, they had seen the Vega cruising around the neighborhood the last couple of days. But um, so at this time, finally, the media was alerted about a rapist on the loose. So the the media finally was able to report on the incidences because now we're up to five. So it only took five women getting raped. Jerk. Yes. And uh, but see, and here's where the thing is. I think he played off the media, too, because attack number six is four days later on October 9th, 1976, 4.30 a.m., right back in Rancho Cardova, a young 16-year-old girl woke up to a, ah, to a man. man beginning to tie her up and gag her. So she's not even she's not even awake yet, and she's already getting tied up. Wow. He didn't even wake them up this time. No, he was, he was automatically just tying her up. Um, he took a knife to her chest, breathing hard, and left a little like slit or a cut and told her you better have my money she was perplexed 
and on what money. So he dragged her outside, laid her on a blanket on a patio, and he and he said, "I've been dreaming for this for some time." Then he forci- forcibly raped her, groped her, and dragged her in, back inside the house to the couch, rummaged through the house, and then raped her again. Then took her outside to the patio furniture, tied her up, cut all the phone lines, and said, if you scream in the next 15 minutes, I live just down the street. I'll hear you and I'll come back and kill you. Her friend an hour later found her on the patio as as uh, she was come, coming to walk with her to school. The police came and found the same characteristics and the girl gave the same description of the man with a small penis with a, you know, the ski mask, brown thing, boots, everything. So it's at this. Yeah, exactly. He should have been the small penis rapist. (laughs) That's that. (laughs) So it's at this time, the media really took off and naming the predator, the East area rapist and a task force was finally formed. The cops had the same point of entry from the kitchen as the description of the rapist and even down to the small penis. One thing that was different was the yarn that he I'm mean, picture this. He takes yarn and he makes it like spider webs throughout the house, through the hallways, through the doors, because police believe he didn't know if anyone was gonna return, if anyone was even home, and he was taking advantage of the situation, not doing his normal rummaging through the house, but if you were to open a door, come through, and all this like spider web of yarns in your face, it's going to disorient you, or it's going to slow you down. At least they're going through the house, or you're going to make some noise, right? Yeah. So, with all that said, yeah, with all that said, he used that as his warning system, and he took advantage. Um, so, no, so he didn't use plates no more. Not in this particular time, he didn't use plates. Okay. But. Check this out. The neighbor next door said his house, when when all the cops were there, he came outside and said his house had been burglarized just the night before and rings, like several rings were left in his house, which when the cops took a look at the rings, they belonged not to him and his wife, but to other people that had been assaulted the four to five previous attacks. What? Yeah. So then the cops looked at this guy like, is he the rapist? Because, you know, he kind of was like almost six feet. And lo and behold, guess what's in his driveway? A Chevy Vega. So. <laughs> wow. So the cops actually took a look at this guy and actually brought him down to the station. And while he's given his alibi and they're checking him out, literally, because they actually looked at the size of his penis and took pictures. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. They wanted to see if he had an unusually no, small that's, penis. That's kind of jacked up, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that is smart, though. I mean, the women would be able to identify Yeah, him. I mean, that's smart. And you know what? That was actually crossing my mind. I was like, why can't they just check every man's yin-yang and see, hey, <laughs> let me see how small you are. Case closed. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny you say that because there was over 200 suspects in, you know, over – in this East Area Rapist thing, where they checked on previous predators, sexual offenders, whatever, and a lot of them, and I mean a lot of them, they actually did say, whip it out, let's take a look at that penis, <laughs> because if it, t- <laughs> yeah, if it's if it's not small, you're free to go. <laughs> if you're under three inches, stay with us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> You better hope and pray you get the biggest bone. Hey, and you know what? That's the other thing. It's sort of like the opposite of when you go to a theme park and it says you have to be this tall to ride the ride. It's like you have to be this short to get arrested. You got to be this long. No pressure. With a hard on. Come on. Come on. God. So, oh, dear. so going we back. We did say viewer discussion is divine. That is true. There's a lot of penis talk in this one. <laughs> Man, but this, but going back to the story with a guy, the next door neighbor's house overlooked the girl's house, and so this me this means the East Area rapist scoped out that dude's home, and because of his car, because of his kind of resemblance to him, pl- the police believe he planted the evidence on purpose to distract the police from the actual predator. 
smart. Very smart. Gotta give him, gotta give him credit. Gotta give him credit there. Freaking jerk, though. Gotta give him credit there. I mean, I'm, I'm not <laughs> saying. No, I'm not saying he what he did is right, but he's very smart. He planned these things out. You gotta, man. Yeah, I mean, this was this was not. True, true, but you'll see how long it takes him to get caught. But um, yeah. but on this one, after this occurrence, and they're still investigating this one. Just nine days later, uh, going back to the city of Carmichael on October 18, 1976, at 2.30 a.m., a family dog started to bark and go crazy. <clears throat> the 10-year-old boy in the house woke up and said, stupid dog, let me let him outside. Maybe, you know, he sees a squirrel, sees something in the backyard. Picture this. You're a 10-year-old kid, again with the eye crust, again in your pajamas, you open a sliding glass door, it's dark outside, you let the dog out, you look up, and there's a man standing in the yard, butt naked from the waist down, with a shirt, with a ski mask, with a knife, and with a billy club in the other hand, looking dead at you. What the crap? Like, <laughs> you run! Yeah. You scream, first of all. <laughs> well, here's, here's the unfortunate thing. The dog acted like it was a pit bull, but unfortunately, it was a chihuahua. It ran at the guy and at first startled the man as he turned around, but then he looked at the size of the dog and then kicked it like a football. Then he ran after the t towards the sliding glass door where the where the uh, kid then locked the door. The kid ran to the bath to to the bedroom, yelling and trying to wake up his mom as he was. The rapist was already coming through the kitchen window. As as the mom got up and was going to get the daughter, the rapist confronted the mom and grabbed her, pushed her against the wall, pushed the kids into the room and said, I'm going to kill all of you if you don't do what I tell you to do. He said, grab the dog, shut it up, or I'll or I'll kill or I'll start killing your kids and then you. So she he stayed in the room with the kids. She went grabbed the dog, put him in the utility closet. And she, uh, she said, my daughter, please don't hurt my daughter. Please don't hurt my son. He said, shut up. Else I'm a butcher the entire family. So as they came in, <clears throat> he takes the, the, he, he takes the mom, ties her up like he did with the other diamond shaped stuff. Same MO, same everything. But he takes the kids at the end of the bed. There's the, you know, the little railing or the headboards, he ties, he blindfolds the kids, ties them up, and then puts a sheet over them so he can't see them. Then he goes through the house, ransacking, eating food. He co comes back to the mom and says, you're very pretty. Do you tan? And she says, no. And then she says, I'm pregnant. And then he said, oh. he said, I don't care. And then he pulled out his penis and he sodomized her. Then he, he went back outside, put some stuff into a bag, came back, did it again. Then he lubricated himself, came back and raped her. Then went back again, came oh, came back again, raped her, left the room. So three times? Yes. Then then he rubbed a knife from her neck to her chest, like leaving almost sort of like a scratch. And like, you know how you like you barely bleed, like you just a little bit went on yeah, a scratch. Yeah, yeah. He left one of those wounds on her. Now, this is the third time in a row he's done this. Then he threatened her kids. And then he came up to her again, raped her again, raped her again. And then she said, at this point, she's like going out of her mind. So she told her, she tried to play a situation in her head where maybe if I'm nice to him, he'll leave me alone. So he, so she told him, you're the best lover I've ever had. You must hear that all the time. It started to play with his head to where he was like, he started talking to her. Then they had a conversation and she thought, okay, this is it. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, he took it out on her again, raped her one more time to where she passed out. Um, it was, she doesn't know when he left other than the fact that she woke up to her kids crying. And so when she was able to, oh, he raped her six times. He raped her six times. Pig. And she's pregnant. She's like three or four months pregnant at this time. 
Yep. No offense to the lady, but at least she didn't get pregnant from the pig because she was already pregnant. Absolutely. I mean, that's the only thing that she could take out of that. Um, she got free and realized all the phone lines were cut and she had to go to the neighbors and the police showed up. Richard Shelby showed up. And then another one that you're going to hear a lot of is Carolyn Daly. She's a detective that a lot of the victims as this went along called her like the angel. Like she would always come. And whenever the, the woman was raped, she was right there holding her helping her with, you know, the embarrassing parts when you have to go to the hospital and they do a rape kit on you. And then even afterwards, she would come by the house to check up on them. She would um, offer them advice or just a listening ear. So she would play the psychologist and she was very helpful. Yeah, she was very loving as a detective. She took time out of her own time to be with these women. Um, so, uh, the police would find the same MOs as they, you know, as they went through the whole thing. The the MO was the exact same: the clenched teeth, the clothes, the 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 weapons, the the knots, um, everything. But they, and then they brought bloodhounds in again, and they trailed the scent to a yard about a block away, and the dogs did the same exact weird motions, and so they believed the again. Ah. Yeah, so they, they, they figured, man, there's something wrong with this guy. You know, like maybe this guy is not going to be around very long or, or maybe he's into some crazy drugs. And so they actually started to pick up drug dealers and other people in the neighborhood, known drug offenders, because they're figuring, you know, it might be the same guy. And they actually had the dog sniff every last one of them to see if there was any kind of like different, uh, you know, same reaction, basically. Um, so Shelby knew that there was a serial rapist and this guy's just amping up as he's going, he's getting fearful. The, um, the media is going a little crazy now at this time. And, um, people had seen a Lincoln continental in the area quite a few times. So that was a known drug car. So a lot of, you know, again, they were investigating the druggies in the neighborhood. So that's crazy. Yeah. So as we're moving on, we're almost done with the episode here, guys. But acto- uh, attack number eight happened the same day, though. Because remember, this one's at 2.30 a.m., right? Or 11.30 a.m., sorry. Yeah. Or, um, yeah. No, it's 12.30 p.m., so the day had just started, right? That same day, 11 p.m., uh, in Rancho Cardova, a 19-year-old woman was getting out of her car when a ski masked man put a knife to her throat and said, shut up with clenched teeth. Said, all I want is your money in your car. However, he took her to a yard with a blanket. He assaulted her for just a few minutes, and he was then he blindfolded her and took off in her car just minutes before her family came home to the house. The cops then would believe that he knew the family's schedule and just figured, I'm going to get this one in while I can. God. Yeah. Well, he's not waiting anymore. He's really enjoying he, he, this he's now. Just, he's just going for it. He yeah. don't care. Yeah, he sure is. And at this time, the media in San Francisco, as far as Oregon, because you don't have CNN at this time, you don't have any of those national news to where you can catch a story in Ohio from California and things like that. But the big cities were picking up on it. There was like, hey, there's a problem in the East Area, and it's below Sacramento, which is the capital of California. So now Sacramento's starting to worry about the East area rapist. So it's all over the newspapers and news at this time. <clears throat> um, so now everybody's on alert. Yeah. Everyone's on alert at this time. Um, the detectives found out the neighbors um, on the street had reported small things being stolen and hang up calls on the same block. So it's just, it's just happening. But these people, if they would report it, Maybe that could give the cops a heads up, but they're not reporting it until after there's an offense. That's the problem. That's crazy, man. Yep. So attack number nine, I think, is the last one we're going to cover on this one, is in the city of Citrus Heights. It's almost a month later. On Wednesday, November 10th, 1976, a 16-year-old was doing homework alone when he, when, uh, he climbed into her window. As he did, he held a knife to her chest and kicked the poodle that was on her lap, then stomped it because it kept barking and said, shut it up or else I will kill it. 
So she kind of like locked it in her closet. He said, all I want is your money. She said, I have none. He said, in clenched teeth, interesting. So he took her outside on the, on the patio was, and, and, and as she's being carried outside, he sees not, um, was, or she sees on her own bike, shoestrings hanging from it and diamond knots. So he already had stuff outside re ready for her. Oh, he yeah. was prepared. Oh, he was already prepared. Yeah, yeah, he was already prepared. He he proceeded to tie her up with these diamond knots. He took her down to the canal way, which was behind her house, through the shrubs, into a quiet little area. They reached a spot where there was a tree and a little area that already had a blanket laid out upon it. Um, then he blindfolded her, but as she, as he was starting to blindfold her, she got a description. He was actually wearing military pants, a mil, a Vietnam veteran jacket, but he had the ski mask on and the boots. Um, she said she smelled a foul odor and thought it was his breath, but it was like a distinctive, real rancid smell. Um, so she's, Let me guess. so she's outside. <laughs> No, she's outside. Or what do you want to guess? It was his Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> or lack thereof. I think we could recognize it was his winker. That's what he has. <laughs> well, actually, actually, I can't, t I can't give this one away what the smell was yet. That's going to come later. But okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But um, just keep that in mind, too. Put a pin in that one as well. All right. Um, Got to write that down? Yeah. <laughs> Distinct smell, right? <laughs> Foul odor. <laughs> <laughs> so he then stripped her naked. He asked her, uh, "Are you a student at American River College?" She said, "No, I'm in high school." And he looked really puzzled. And the thing is, is the house adjacent to the house that he broke into of the sixteen-year-old? There was a girl that went to American River College, and she looked identical to the 16-year-old, like they were twins. Wow. So at this point, either he was, it was too dark or he got confused, but he actually went into the wrong house. And wow. So, so he, what he did was he just copped the fill on her to make it official that he assaulted her. And then he just, for whatever reason, it didn't float his boat anymore that the target he wanted wasn't the one that he got. So Dang. before her parents came home, he tied her back up and placed her on the, uh, on the uh, what do you call it, the uh, patio. The parents came home, found well, he her. Didn't really, huh? So he didn't really rape this one. He just kind of molested her. Yeah, he had intentions to rape the college girl but this girl looked exactly like her but for whatever reason even though she was three or four years younger he just decided not to um wow. yeah the, so the fact that he took her off property was a form of kidnapping at the time um and he had different clothes so at this point this case wasn't exactly um categorized in the east area rapist for a while because he wasn't wearing the same clothes he didn't do the same things. He didn't um, rummage through the house at this at this point either. He just, you know, took her out as quickly as he could to the canal, and they thought maybe it was a copycat. But then it would be found later on. The shoe prints would match another one, another case, and they did find the you know the knots were the same as well. So at first they didn't want to say it was, but then boom, there it was. So wait, wait, that's that's stupid though, like. He still took her out. He took her to the patio. He still tied her up. How mm -hmm. would they not, like, tie them together? Because at the time, the police weren't trying to link as many cases together because they felt that if the more cases they linked together, the worse it made them look. Mm. You know? And, and the fact that they had to chalk yeah. another one up to this rapist who... The, now the media is aware, the community is aware, and people are pissed and scared... Because at this time now, people are buying dogs again, and they're trying to get in-home security stuff because, you know, this guy's prolific, and it doesn't appear like the cops are doing anything right. Wow. So This is crazy. So we'll leave this one here for this episode. 
Just one. It's crazy, man. Yeah. So he has nine victims so far of raping. Well, mm-hmm. Although this one he didn't rape, except for her, but... And we have we have some to come that I'm actually going to just say, okay, on this date, this happened. I'm not going to get too much descriptive in it because he will literally do the exact same things. So I will mention the dates as we move along, but I'm also just going to briefly talk about it, not go in depth like I did on these. And then it won't yeah. be till the series changes again to where – I have to describe it because he changes up his entire... So everything he was doing, he'll keep the knots, but he does stuff different to where you're like, oh, damn. You know what I mean? So I have to get into it on yeah. those. Yeah. All right. But that is Ooh. today's case.